Hello, I'm Gail Alston. I'm the director of the Training Center for Excellence at the Rosalind Carter Institute for Caregiving in Americas, Georgia. I'm going to be speaking with you today about evidence-based interventions, evidence-based supports for family caregivers, as well as evidence-based implementation. And also we're going to be talking about translational research and about a particular program that we offer through our training center, which is RCI REACH. For several years, the Rosalind Carter Institute has focused on how caregiving process, well, the caregiving process on caregiver health. We've also been looking for interventions that have been proven to help family caregivers and the science behind the implementation of these evidence-based caregiver interventions. What we've learned during this research and during this study is that evidence-based interventions have been developed across a wide variety of conditions, from dementia to cancer, for stroke victims and their caregivers, as well as conditions such as Parkinson's disease and many others types of conditions. Evidence-based interventions have been proven to be effective in achieving important outcomes for the caregivers that they serve. Those outcomes include uh, better caregiver health and well-being. It also reduces or delays placing in nursing homes. And of course, as you can imagine, most people would like to stay in their homes as long as possible. So this is an important outcome for our evidence-based interventions. It also improves the quality of care that the caregiver is able to provide to their loved ones in the caregiving experience. I want to explain to you a little bit about what makes an evidence-based program an evidence-based program. First of all, these have been uh, done in a clinical setting. They've been tried out usually in universities, research universities, places such as that, and they've un undergone rigorous scientific evaluation. The random control trial is like the golden standard for evidence-based programs. And when you have a random control trial, that means you select randomly a group of participants who are going to receive the treatment that you're hoping to prove is effective. And the other parts, of the other number of participants are included in a control setting. So they just receive ordinary care and they don't receive the treatment that you're testing for its effectiveness. Evidence-based programs have demonstrated the ability to achieve outcomes of importance to family caregivers, such as this chart demonstrates. This indicates that we've been able to reduce the caregiver burden, reduce their depression, and also improve their mood. As you'll see, the before is, is greater. They're, they're having higher scores that indicate higher levels of burden or depression or mood problems. And after in the red demonstrates that they've reduced the score that is indicating their levels in these three areas. And finally, evidence-based programs have been published in peer-reviewed journal articles. And this is, this is a prestigious thing to have your article uh, published in a journal. It's also difficult because you really have to demonstrate what you did how you did it, and what the results were in a meaningful way that have been, has been statistically analyzed to indicate that it was your program, not just by chance, that these outcomes had been achieved. We've learned that evidence-based interventions have certain characteristics in common, those that are effective do anyway. They, have, they are tailored specifically to the people they serve, the individual they serve. We found that the cookie cutter approach doesn't really work as well because every caregiver, although they might have some similar experiences, they're also having very specific and unique experiences and they need help in those areas. So evidence-based interventions that are most effective are tailored to the specific needs of each individual served. We also find that you have to have a multi-component approach. It's not just one single thing that you deliver to the family caregivers. For instance, the, this, this slide shows that some of these evidence-based programs will have direct services, plus they'll have some training and problem-solving skills. There's definitely a need for stress management training. Uh, there might be information, counseling. Uh, they might even provide extra services such as respite and other resources for the caregiver. And finally, we find that the most effective evidence-based interventions 
offer the caregiver a one-on-one -on -one interaction with a helper or a caregiver coach. And it's that relationship and that availability of a very personalized and, and trained caregiver coach that can help them through the challenges of family caregiving. It's also found that evidence-based programs that bring around the best results tend to be a heavier dosage, meaning that they might have more often interactions or they might go on for a longer period of time or even both. The more interactions the caregiver has with that caregiver coach or the interventionist usually indicates a more improvement in those outcomes that we're looking to impact positively. To summarize, our evidence-based programs, they've gone through rigorous scientific evaluation. They achieve outcomes of importance to the family caregivers. They're published in a peer-reviewed scientific journal. They're tailored to the caregiver's specific needs. They're multi-component, offering several different types of services and interventions. And the helper has a specific intervention protocol, as well as they're providing a heavier dose of support to that family caregiver. At RCI, we believe that the widespread adoption of evidence-based programs is extremely important because we feel that it will significantly lower caregiver stress. In fact, it's been proven to do so. We also think that by implementing more evidence-based support programs for our family caregivers, that we're able to keep the loved ones at home longer, keeping them out of the nursing homes and in the homes with their family where they really prefer to be. We also improve the quality of life for the caregiver as well as the care recipient. All of these are very important impacts that the evidence-based programs have had on the populations that they've served. And we want to work to see that more and more families have access to these kind of proven programs. So the big question is, well, how do we get these evidence-based programs from the clinical setting in those research uh, institutions and from the higher level doctoral type implementation people into the community agencies where people might not have the same level of education and experience, however they have that daily interaction with family caregivers. We need to get our evidence-based programs off the shelves in libraries and into the community where they can help the caregivers most effectively. And the way we do that is translational research where we're taking the intervention from science to practice. <clears throat> now, one definition of translational research is the application of evidence-based interventions developed in clinical settings to community-based service agencies for delivery to the intended target population. A little bit simpler way of saying that is, it's the bridge from the discovery that this intervention is good and it will be important for caregivers to delivery. RCI REACH is actually a translation of REACH2. REACH2 was a, a, wide, a widely renowned caregiver support program that was developed across the nation. And it was something that RCI took on in 2008 to translate through a community agency. We were able to do this using funding that was provided through the Alzheimer's Disease Supportive Services Program and through the Administration on Living, which is a federally funded program in the United States. As you can see, we ran this program from October 2008 to March 2012. Then we were able to report our results, and it was quite a successful translation of REACH2. Now REACH stands for Resources to Enhance Alzheimer's Caregiver Health. So this was an intervention specific for dementia caregivers. Not just Alzheimer's caregivers, but any type of dementia. Now why did we select RCI REACH for our translation, or REACH 2 for our translation? Because we read the, all the articles and we were really impressed by how REACH 2 provided hope to the caregiver. It was a very positively based intervention that raised the level of confidence of the caregivers as well as their hope in their ability to handle the challenges of caregiving. REACH2 was actually built around the concept of the stress health process model. As you can see here, you start with the care recipient, the disability, then the, the caregiver will appraise the demands of that disability of their loved one. 
against their ability to handle those demands. And it's that difference between what is needed here and do I have what it takes to meet those needs that will lead to the perceived stress levels. If they don't believe they have what, they, what it takes to meet the needs of their loved one, then their perceived stress level is higher. The response to that perceived stress then becomes either emotional, which could lead to depression if they don't feel like they're up to it, or it can lead to confidence and reassurance if they do feel like they're able to handle it. And also behavioral responses. People are under a great deal of stress. People who feel like they're not able to deal with it tend to engage in behaviors that are not healthy and helpful and can actually be detrimental to their health. And if they do that, then that might lead to morbid morbidity or mortality, meaning that they could become sick. And in some cases, caregivers become so ill from the stress that they're experiencing, they, they actually die during their caregiving time. Now, it is, one study has shown that it is the perceived stress level that leads to the, the morbidity and mortality. So it's not necessarily the level of care that is needed, it's not the level of demands that is placed upon the caregiver, but it's how they perceive their ability to meet those demands that can lead to illness and even death. And that's where REACH comes in, because REACH actually comes in and works on the appraisal of demands and the caregiver's ability to meet those demands. That the training, the tools, the techniques, the strategies that are offered in REACH will help them feel stronger and more able to meet the demands and therefore reduce their perception of the level of stress that they experience. All the caregivers that are served by RCI REACH get training in th these different areas. They're trained in problem solving techniques. They're also given several different types of positive thinking and mood management activities that they can engage in that helps them think about their lives in a more positive way. And finally, there are a number of stress management techniques that help them work through the, the, the impact that stress has on you physically so that they, it doesn't do the harm on them physically that it would do if they engaged in less helpful behaviors. RCI provides hope. It provides caregivers with a better understanding of their loved one's condition and their troubling behaviors. and also gives them those tools and strategies that will help them feel hopeful about their ability to handle the stressors and the challenges that they face. Another reason we picked REACH to implement with our program was because REACH is powerful. This is a quote that appeared in the Annals of Internal Medicine in 2006. They said, if these interventions were drugs, it is hard to believe they would not be on the fast track to approval, meaning that it is so effective that it is even in some cases more effective than some of the um, depression, antidepressant medications that are on the market today. That's quite an endorsement for a behavioral, non-pharmaceutical intervention for caregiver burden and depression. These are the key elements of the, R of the REACH program in what has become the RCI REACH program. They address safety issues, social support because caregivers so often become isolated and they feel very alone in their caregiving experience. REACH reaches in and tries to reconnect them to their friends and their outside activities to recreate their social support. It also addresses the problem behaviors. They develop prescriptions for solving the problem behaviors. And we found that the inability of caregivers to address, to understand and have effective responses to dementia behaviors, that oftentimes will lead them to premature placement of their loved one in a residential facility. So it's very important to give them the tools to better understand those dementia behaviors and also strategies to respond to those dementia behaviors in such a way that makes them feel confident that they can deal with it. Emotional well-being. A large percentage of caregivers develop depression over the period of their caregiving, their caregiving experience. So working with them to reduce their stress, learn how to relax, learn better communication skills, and also increasing the pleasant events to offset some of those challenging events is a critical part of the REACH program. And then there's self-care. Family caregivers often 
neglect their own needs, their own medical needs, their own emotional needs, and, and so that they can better care for their loved one. However, the end result is that, that they, they will become less healthy emotionally and physically that actually de decreases their ability to take care of their loved one. So it has the opposite effect of what they intend to do. Now, REACH is actually a six-month program. During those six months, the, the caregiver coach is going to meet with that caregiver for 12 sessions. Usually nine of those sessions are face-to-face, -face, either in the home or a location for the caregiver's choice, and three of them are by phone. Sessions are structured with um, scripts. We actually tell them that this is what you need to say so they have an idea of what the content is. We don't ask that they memorize the scripts and deliver them word for word, but by having the script, then that helps familiarize them with what's expected to be delivered in each, each session, so then they can de develop their own way of expressing that content. That also ensures that they're delivering the, the, the content that is intended from this evidence-based program. That's how we get to fidelity. Fidelity is a big issue in delivering evidence-based programs. If you're not being faithful to the original content, to those key components, to the protocol that was established with the evidence-based program, then you cannot expect to achieve the same positive outcomes. Fidelity is a very important concept for evidence-based programs. Now, the sessions include, you begin with a risk assessment. This is a data collection where the interventionist is asking the caregiver a number of questions and then developing their scores. That data helps us compare the pre-treatment pre to the post-treatment so then we know if the program actually made the impact that we hoped that it would. We also include education on dementia. So often the family caregivers have been given a lot of information about dementia, but they haven't really been able to absorb it. So by having an interventionist, the caregiver coach, sit across the table from them and answer their specific questions, then they have the opportunity to finally truly understand the dementia. And this goes a long way in helping them better know how to cope with the behaviors that they're dealing with. We also help them understand what the stress of caregiving could be doing to them physically and emotionally. They may have not understood that some of the symptoms that they're experiencing are due to the stress of their caregiving. They just realize, I'm more irritable than usual, or I can't seem to make a decision the way I used to be able to, or I'm not being able to sleep at night. They're not connecting that these symptoms are related to the stress of their caregiving. So part of this intervention, part of the evidence-based program, is to help them link that so then they'll understand the importance of learning stress management techniques. And finally, through the process, we identify three of their top challenges, and we work through the problem-solving model that we teach them, and we help them come up with strategies to address those specific challenges. The idea is that we're going to empower them through this process so that after the program is over, they'll be able to use that process as new problems come up. Because we know that when the interventionist is no longer interacting with them on a regular basis, they need to have developed these skills that will carry them on into the future. Because the problem they're dealing with today is not necessarily going to be the problem they're going to be dealing with next year. And finally, the mood management technique we train them is to help lower their depression. It has to do with positive thinking and also reconnecting to your life prior to caregiving so that you don't lose that connection with who you are outside the caregiving experience. Our assessment is rather in-depth. These are the types of insurance instruments that we're using in our data collection. There's a risk appraisal which identifies safety issues that need to be addressed immediately. We have the caregiver well-being scale, which is a Zaret burden scale, that tells us whether or not they're in the danger level of burden. For the Zaret burden scale, any score over 17 would be considered a caregiver at high risk of burden. Oftentimes, it's not unusual for us to enroll a caregiver that would score in the 20s on that Zaret burden scale. However, 
after the program, they usually drop substantially below that 17 score benchmark. So we know that we've brought them from the high level, high risk level, down to a level that is much more manageable and no, they're no longer at such risk for their health. We do ask them some self-reported questions about caregiver health. Uh, the main question is, how do you feel today um, in comparison to how you felt six months ago? The desire to institu institutionalize gives us an idea of how close they are to placing their loved one in a residential facility. This is important because we really hope to make an impact on their situation so that they will be less likely to place that person in a nursing home, basically because most people want to stay at home and most caregivers want to keep their loved one at home as long as possible. We use the CESD-10 to gauge the level of caregiver depression. The benchmark on the CESD-10 is 10. Anyone scoring over 10 would be considered uh, clinically depressed. And if we find out that that's the case, we're not doctors, we can't really prescribe medications for them, but we do wanna make sure that we, we recommend that they go to their doctor and discuss that situation with them. And then we also give them some non-pharmaceutical strategies to help lower that depression scale. And it has been quite effective. The self-efficacy scales is all about how confident these caregivers are in their ability to meet those demands. Remember our perceived stress is demands versus how capable we feel we are to meet those demands. Self-efficacy scales is how we measure their confidence and their ability to meet the demands of their caregiving. Global deterioration scale actually lets us know where along the, the dementia progression their loved one is. And finally, we do a safety walkthrough, where we just walk through the house and identify things that might be a safety hazard for the care recipient. People might not realize that it's very important to change the, the, the home environment. Things such as make sure things are well lit, uh, remove throw rugs that someone might trip over, those types of things we help identify very early on because we know that people with dementia are at higher risk of falls and falls can oftentimes uh, cause bones to break, hips to break, that can really increase the, 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 the problems that are associated with caregiving. I want to share with you some of our outcomes that we have found through our RCI REACH programs that we have been able to implement. You see on the left, this is our burden scale. We talked about the Zaret burden scale. And we said that the 17 was the number at which people were considered at high risk. This particular implementation site was able to low, lower the burden score from 19.1, which was quite a bit above that 17 benchmark, to 16.3 with a p-value of less than 0.05, which means that we have reached statistical significance and we can feel confident that it was the intervention that brought this, that score down within a more reasonable range. The depression score was also lowered from above the 10 benchmark to below the 10 benchmark. This particular imp implementation site did not see it lowered that much below the benchmark. However, it's still within a more healthy range. Again, in that P factor of less than 0.05, meaning that we can be very confident that it was the intervention that brought about this change, not just chance. We did see that the caregiver self-reported health was improved. For this particular scale, the lower the number, the better. So they did lower, we had statistically significantly reduced um, problems with the caregiver's health. And the, our self-efficacy score, again, you will see that it did improve. I wanted to share with you some of the words that people, words of endorsement that the family caregivers give us. They're so excited and so pleased with the changes that they see in themselves after participating in this program. This particular caregiver says, you know, I really feel so much better about things after our visit. At first, I didn't think I needed help, but now that I see how much better I feel, I know that I did need help. 
What we found is often family caregivers don't spend a lot of time thinking about themselves and their own needs. So when we offer them the program, sometimes they'll say, oh no, I'm fine. I would rather you do something for my loved one. I don't need any help. But after spending some time with our interventionists, they realize that they have been impacted by the problems and the challenges of caregiving. And they are experiencing some of the negative impacts that their burden scores are high, their depression scores are high. And then after going the pro through the program, they realize how much better they feel after receiving the intervention. This caregiver says, you have no idea how much this program has changed both my life and my husband's life for the better. We never could have known what a positive effect this would have on our lives, but we owe it all to you and this program. I can't tell you how good it feels to hear these kind of comments come from our caregivers who's been, who've been through the program. All of us at RCI, this is what we work for. This is why we, why we work so hard. This is because we know we're making a difference in the lives of caregivers, and it's very rewarding. This caregiver states, this has helped me in ways that nothing else has been able to help me. I've been to support groups and read informational books, but this has been by far the most helpful. As I said earlier, caregivers are oftentimes given a lot of information and they, they take it and then they just set it aside. But when you have that opportunity for one-on-one -on -one conversations with the caregiver coach, where you can ask the questions that you need answers for, it makes a huge difference. And, and it also establishes that connection with that caregiver coach. The, the coaches and the caregivers become very close throughout this program. And I really love the fact that when we go through our data, we find that 100% of our caregivers that complete our, our program evaluation after they participate in the program said that they would recommend it to others. That just, that just makes me feel so good to know that they, they got so much benefit out, 100% of them got so much benefit out of this program that they would be glad to recommend it to anybody they know that might be also going through caregiving experiences. Now I talked about the translational research and I want to share with you that it's sometimes a very complicated pr process it's, it's, and it's a long-term process. As you see, it started out with the REACH-1 program. Then we have the randomized control trial of REACH-2. REACH-2 built on what they learned from REACH-1. Then the Veterans Administration in the United States they translated a program to be delivered through their agency. And they took what they learned and developed the REACH VA dementia. When RCI decided to implement REACH, we actually used the model that the Veterans Administration had developed. We took that model and we implemented it in RCI through the, as Georgia REACH. We implemented it on a very small scale through our caregiver support program. We took the lessons we learned there and we went to an area agency on aging, which is an agency that serves families in a, a, a number of different ways, but we were able to specifically serve families who were coping with dementia through the area agency on aging in coastal Georgia. And, and that, was, that was another opportunity for us to learn more. We took the lessons learned from the, our coastal Georgia reach, and then we ended up with our final project, which is RCI Reach. We renamed it because we knew that we wanted to now take this program that we had, we had tailored to fit through the Community Aging Services Network around the country. I want to talk a little bit about that science of evidence-based implementation. Because when we first started taking reach to other agencies and, ha and, and helping them implement it using their, their staff and their resources, we found out that they really needed more than just training in the intervention. They needed training and guidance in, in the, the process of implementing an evidence-based program. Because evidence-based programs are different in that they use very structured protocols, they have very specific uh, skill sets that the interventionists need. And also, evidence-based programs use data 
to um, first of all make sure that they're reaching the goals that they intended to reach, but also any decisions that are made through that process are based on data. We don't just think about, well, maybe this, maybe that. We go to the data to see if it supports any sorts of tweaking we want to make to that intervention in this particular setting. So we, we broke it down here. First of all, is a, planning is a big part of evidence-based programs. We found that when you want to implement an evidence-based program, you do a lot more work, a lot more thought, before you even begin the intervention. And the planning process helps the agency really look at what do we really need here? Is this a good intervention? Is it gonna meet our needs? How does, how does it fit into our, our culture of our agency? How does it fit into our overall strategy for this agency? And then once they decide that this, this is a good fit for us, then they go into the preparation. And the preparation is rather intense because they're gonna have to find the right people to hold the jobs down, but they also have to make sure that the, the entire staff is involved in preparing for it. We want every member of that staff to be able to explain what the program is, to fully understand who should be referred to that program, and also to be ready to provide additional resources to our program participants. We do an activity that we call process mapping when we're preparing a, an implementation site. The process mapping includes um, just walking through what's gonna happen from the time the caregiver calls seeking services, right on through to the delivery of the, of the of the intervention and the completion of the intervention. And this is important so that we can always go back and make sure that things are, do, are happening the way they should. This helps us track how the paperwork's gonna flow, how the data is gonna be managed, and what are, where are our feedback loops. We set up some um, what we call process improvement loops so that people will know at what point they can come back and make suggestions from our lessons learned. That's very important in our evidence-based implementation. We also, at that point, establish our partnerships because it's not just the agency that's gonna be working in this field. We need partners from the community to be referring people in and also be providing auxiliary resources to our participants. We do, or we, we do very much want full participation of staff at all levels, from the person who answers the phone at the reception desk, right up to the director of each of those agencies. They need to understand the program, they need to be able to explain the program, and they need to be championing the program. And again, w there are some challenges to implementing the, the evidence-based programs. We always emphasize how important it is to get the right staff person in that caregiver coach position. We're very selective about who we hire for these programs. We put them through uh, at least a two interview process. And in both of those interviews, we have our candidates uh, role play how they would deliver that intervention as if they were actually in the field talking to a caregiver. And that gives us a really good idea of their ability to establish rapport and also their ability to coach rather than just give information. Because this is an empowerment model, which means that we're coaching that caregiver to be able to handle these challenges long after the, coach, the caregiver coach is gone. We also wanna make sure that our interventionists and our caregiver coaches are faithful to the pro protocols. Sometimes we found that some of the candidates for the positions may have had a very strong background in working with dementia uh, patients and their caregivers. And we thought that that would be something really good, but sometimes it meant that they were very much set in their ways and they weren't really open to doing things by protocol. They wanted to do things the way they'd always done them. And that was a problem. So we, this was by the role playing, we could easily tell who was gonna be able to stick to their protocol or who wanted to do things their old way and were really not open to doing them according to the intervention that we were trying to, to um, provide. The data collection, not everybody believes in data collection, so we had to be very careful to find people who felt strongly about the importance of good collection, accurate collection, 
good data management, and then the use of data in decision making. And most of all, we want to make sure that we're getting the right service to the people who need it most. Now, RCI REACH is an intervention that's really tailored for people at high risk, meaning that they're already beginning to experience some of the symptoms of burnout, um, and, and they're, they're burdened, and they're, they may be having some depression. So we, we, it's because it's an intense intervention, we want to make sure that we're reaching those people that are truly in need. People who are at the very beginning of their caregiving journey, they might be better off in a less intense type program, uh, one that's maybe a classroom based or, or, or education, psychoeducation based. RCI REACH is for people who really need very intense one on one coaching. Another implementation process that we bring to, to our agencies that are beginning to implement RCI REACH is we require that the interventionists or the caregiver coaches, I hope I haven't been confusing you, interventionists and caregiver coach, that's the same thing, we just use them interchangeably. We require that they go through a certification process because we want to make sure that the first time they sit across the table from that caregiver, that they're really ready to deliver this intervention in the right way. We expect them to use the coaching techniques. I already spoke a little bit about that. that. We expect them to be faithful to the protocol. And then throughout the time they serve as a coach, we expect them to be keeping abreast of the most current information about dementia. The certification requirements include that they, they do some reading before they're trained. Then we come out and we train them as a day-long training. There's an open book test that we call the learning process worksheet. They have to complete that with at least 75% accuracy. And then two weeks after they go through the classroom training, they have to demonstrate mastery of skills through a, through a role play that's conducted via Skype or FaceTime, something like that. And the master trainer is watching the, um, the caregiver coach deliver different sections of, of the different sessions. And we're grading them on how well they do. We have an observational checklist. and We're just checking off to make sure that they're doing the things they should be doing in the right way. And if they don't do that at least 70% of the time, then we won't certify them. Most people reach, achieve certification or that first try, although some of them do not. And we ask that they go back, study the manuals, practice delivery of the services, and then come back for a second try. I believe that we've never had anybody not achieve certification in their second try. But we really, we want to emphasize to them that this is important to us, that we're not, we're not giving out certifications just to just anybody. You have to show that you've mastered those skills to be a really good interventionist. And the next piece that the RCI does for our implementation sites is that we provide what we call intense technical assistance, which means that we don't just sit back and wait for them to call us if they need us. We set up a care co consultation call list where um, on a monthly basis, we have teleconferences with our agencies that are providing this, this very important program in their community. And in those teleconferences that we hold, we, uh, we ask them about their enrollment. We ask them about um, how, how things are going. Are, are people sticking with the program? How are they doing with the protocol? And then we kind of brainstorm around any problems that we're having. We found that by having these monthly phone calls, it really helps keep our, our implementation sites on task to um, deliver the program the way it should be delivered. And we're also supporting them in, in a way that um, they're just not out there hoping they're doing a good job. We can reaffirm to them that they are doing a great job. And then we're there to help with any problems. This is a different model than you'll usually find for people who are being trained in evidence-based programs, but it's really essential to their success. So we believe that if you pick the right evidence-based intervention and you get the technical assistance in evidence-based implementation, then you're really set up for success. 
In the Rosen Carter Institute, we feel like our success it very much depends on the success of those implementation sites. All of those agencies that have chosen RCI REACH to implement and to provide to their caregivers, we, their success is important to us for a couple of reasons. One is because we want them to provide the best possible services to their caregivers because that ultimately that's what RCI is all about, providing excellent services to family caregivers. But we also want them to be successful so that we'll be able to have even more opportunities to, to spread this intervention around the country. In fact, we are very pleased to let you know that this is where we have RCI REACH being implemented right now around the United States. As you can see, we've been pretty busy training and providing technical technical assistance to agencies all over our country. We really hope that in the not too distant future, we're going to be able to provide training and technical assistance to some agencies here in South Korea. We would love to be able to do that. We believe that RCI REACH would be very, very well translated to a number of different cultures and that we would very much like to help your family caregivers in their caring for d their dementia loved ones as well. So I want to thank you for your attention today. I want to thank you for your interest in, in caregiving and your ongoing support of family caregivers. Thank you.